Amber has a question, then Hannah has a question. Okay, so for the homework, yes. are we going to go over what is it, like we didn't go over any of the wave stuff? Um, so I thought I'd, re did I not remove those? No. No. It's, okay. The first so I, you have to answer the questions that have to do with waves. Right. I took off them. I took off the first three and I thought I took off like the last three as well, but I must so not have. So yeah, I let's let's just look at that real quick because I did extra homework. It is not yeah. easy for me to write, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You're writing. <laughs> I am so sorry. Well, I was just wondering like we could look in the back of the book, but then you like get us through cheating and I'm like, well, how are we going to Well, look in the back of the book is not cheating. Copying from things or, you know, Chegg, of course, is the, the obvious one. That's cheating. You have to pay to cheat, yes. Yeah, but why I would you? Pay, but I don't have the money. I didn't even know that Chegg had that. I thought Chegg was where you could buy books cheaper. What? Isn't that? <laughs> yeah, because my sister used to buy books. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could I, I, I don't know about them buying like textbooks. Books. What I do know is they supply answer keys and stuff so people can cheat. Oh. Whoops, I went to the wrong class. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yes, it is. We, as chair of the Academic Integrity Committee, we deal with Chegg too often. Okay, but I'm just like low-key saying, like, who would want to pay for answers when we're already broke? Exactly. People for whom the okay. answers are all that's important and not learning. Yeah, that's unfortunate for them. Or money, <laughs> Okay, so actually here I can see I have, I didn't change the description. You see I took out 7, 15, and 64. And yeah, take out the um, two, seven, and sixty-one from chapter ten as well. So it's only four questions. So, like, if we already did everything, like, can we get them right? Can we get extra credit? Yeah, can we get extra credit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just it's a valid question. I, I understand your point, but if we do chapter ten and read chapter eight, yeah, it's just chapter eight, just the process from chapter eight. Wait, so then are we done? Yeah, chapter ten. <laughs> we had questions about the wave. Yeah, but I didn't lecture about those. See, that's why I've taken it off of the. Because I'm not expecting you to just go learn on your own. That's. Um. Well, it was what Friday. Friday or Sunday. Are you sure it was up there? Because I'm pretty sure I did everything. Well, I did it like well, it, it, I did it this week. It's it been like this. Day. You can actually look on Moodle. It tells you when I did it. That's what it was. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did more than that. Because I did it in more than that. I don't know. I'm I don't have my notebook. I'll have to check it. Wait, is it touching? Maybe if you changed it on Friday, then I should be good because I didn't like. Um, <laughs> Activity since February 13. Well, that that's not very useful. Full report of recent activity. There we go. This will tell us what I changed it. Do, 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 do. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe not. I, I guess not because I don't see any dates for things here. Okay. So does anyone have questions about those four or so problems we're doing? No. I do have like. I, I don't think so because then <laughs> because, because it's not stuff I covered and and then that would say other people should spend time on stuff that's not going to help them on the test to try to get the extra credit. Okay. Amber. Okay. For question number two, Wait, which is something that we have to do. Um, do we need to fill out a potential test question? No, we don't for today. Today's just review, so no potential test question. Okay, so Amber, question number two. Okay, what does polarized mean? If we know what polarized means, we have the answer. It has charges that align on one side that have slightly more positive on the one side that has slightly more negative. Is that right? Okay, so the charge is separated. Instead of it being uniform, you sure you have separated. So one side is more positive, one side is more negative. So that's what polarized means. Charge just means it has charge. Polarized means you have a separation charge. A polarized object could be neutral. For instance, a typical water atom is going to be neutral. But it's polarized. You have more positive charge on the hydrogen side and more negative charge on the oxygen side. I, I know it's got two ohms, but or two pages 
Um, but it's polarized, but it has no net electric charge. Charge means it has a net electric charge. Could still be polarized. So charge has a net charge. Polarized has a charge separation. May or may not have a net charge. All right. I did have another question. <laughs> But it's like you don't need the homework for it. Okay, what's your other what are, question? What are our other homeworks going to go into the curriculum? Uh, we've been working on that. Um, as soon as we get them graded, and I'm going to step in and do some grading myself yep. to get that done. Guess the grading has fallen behind. Question. Yeah. You said the test is like multiple choice. Yes, right? except for the one question on the scientific method. The rest of it's all multiple choice. Yeah. How good do you think I can do it with a left-hand? <coughs> well, fortunately, you can bubble in with your left hand better than you can write letters with your left hand. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Like, you I mean, because having your injured, I know that having the injured right hand is, or arm is, is not pleasant. Actually, my shoulder. Our shoulder, okay. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't inhibit your thinking. And Thank that's goodness, the, nothing was wrong with my head. <laughs> I was just wondering, like, if I need to, like, figure out something. Um, I don't think so, but if you have a problem, you know, let me know. Okay. Right? We want to take care of things rather than say, don't worry about it. I'm not angry. Be yeah. I'm just kidding. Okay. So let's get into a review here since that's the point of today. So our test is starting with Chapter Zero, the prologue. And going through, as it turns out, only chapter, what was it, eight? We didn't get all the physics covered. Um, the waves is the one thing that I regret that we didn't get covered because I love doing sound. Um, but <clears throat> we have an understanding of physics. So one of the first things that we have, and the thing that's going to be the biggest single chunk of points in your test, like 10% of the test or so, is the scientific method. So you really, really need to know this. Why? Because I really, really have that as the highest priority that students coming out of this class will understand. Why is it important? Because all of scientific understanding is based on the scientific method. If it's not based on the scientific method, it's not science. So if you're a grade school teacher and you're doing science class, it's really important you understand, oh, this is science, <laughs> this is not so much. Also, it's important you understand science doesn't mean that we have the right answer. It means it's the best that we've learned so far by going through this method. So we had four steps. So on your test, you're going to have list the steps of scientific method. And you'll have one, two, three, four. Notice I left a little extra space on two. So step one, what's the first step in the scientific method? Observe something interesting. And that's the first important thing for scientists. They have to be curious. They have to see something and say, ooh, I wonder why, and not just be like, huh. So observe something interesting. Then number two, what do you do? Create a hypothesis that, and we had three things. It won't have one, two, three listed for you. So you have to remember these three things. What's the, there's no specific, or I say, what's the first thing? There's no specific make, order. What three things have to? Make testable predictions. Make testable predictions. And that one's super important. Well, they're all super important. What else? Based on scientific ideas. Okay, it needs to be based on scientific ideas. The key there is it's not, oh, I think so, or just I propose that this happens because this. There has to be some kind of scientific linkage. That's why horoscopes and astrology is not science, because it takes scientific observations and makes predictions, but the predictions aren't actually in any scientific way based on anything. Explain why the observation occurred. Okay, and finally, it has to explain why the observation occurred. Okay. 
because otherwise, how useful is it, right? Look, I observed the sun came up today, you know, probably because uh, I went to bed last night. Going to bed doesn't explain why the sun rises. Okay, so that was step two. Do you want them in that specific order? No, ABC, that order does not matter. Step three. Go back to red. What's step three of our simplified scientific method? Test a prediction of hypothesis. Now, oftentimes, people end up simply saying, I'm going to check to see if my observation is correct. They don't put in those words. But, you know, you have the sun rises in the morning. Well, I'm going to check to see if the sun rises in the morning. That wouldn't be a check of a prediction of your hypothesis. You already have that observation. You need to check another prediction that your hypothesis comes up with. Right? So don't just repeat in different words the observation for your test. Finally, we're done, right? No, we're not done. What happens is our final step. No. Is that like find out you have to redo it? You always have to redo it. If hypothesis passes. Oh, right. I had that written down. I just, in front of that, I said outcome. Okay. Then test different. I just can put differently. You could test the same prediction in a different way, or you could test a different prediction. But you're going to test again, so you're not done. If hypothesis fails, then Revise hypothesis. So this is an endless loop. You never get out of it. Now, if you'll see some that say, you know, at this point, you make a conclusion. But that would suggest that you're done with the scientific method and you're not. The scientific method continues. You are going to disseminate information after you've done a few tests. You're going to do things like that. But you're never done. It's still going to be more testing and more testing. So we have things like the universal law of gravitation that says that there's a force in this ball. That fact said there's a the law of universal gravitation that says that there is a force on this ball due to gravitational force. Is that fact? It's theory. It's a theory. Fact would be something that you've tested an infinite number of times in every possible way, which we just can't do. Now, we do have the word fact defined as things that we can you know, make a measurement all agree on, like I drop it and it fell, or there's a weight pushing down on my hand. But the fact of the fact of, but gravity is still a theory. So when we say theory, that doesn't mean that it's oh, just a guess. Hypotheses were guesses. By the time you get to a theory, it's been tested a lot, and you should have some confidence in it. So theory is not a weak word, right? I talked about many of the people who are like me, creationists, will say that evolution is just a theory. It is true. It's just a theory. But that doesn't mean that it's something not to be believed just because it's a theory. You need to have other reasons why you don't believe it, not the fact that it's a theory. Okay, so make sure you have that. Then you're going to have to apply it. You're going to be given an observation. So you're given an observation. You're told to apply this. So what do you write for step one in applying it? Like what we have said. Yeah, I want you to just point to it. Write down. I would summarize it, right? Because my observation probably would be longer than necessary. But you need to write down there. The reason I'm having you do that is to make sure you understand, yes, this was step one. He gave me step one, but I have to recognize it and put it in my own words. So when we were first learning about this, isn't this what, like the ice cube example that you used? Yes. Okay. 
then you're going to create a, a hypothesis that explains why the observation occurred. So you're going to write down, you know, this happened because of this. It needs to be a scientific reason, not, you know, because, because Jim Bob said it did. <laughs> and then you need to have a prediction, you know, so if this happens, this will occur. So you say, you know, I'm going to test doing this. The hypothesis says this should occur. So that's what you'd have for step three. And then for step four, you'd say, if this occurs, I go back and revise the hypothesis. Or if this occurs, then I'm going to go test differently. You don't say what your new hypothesis will be or what your new test will be. <laughs> Otherwise, the, plot, the question never ends, just like the scientific method never ends. <laughs> okay, so do you understand that? Like I said, it's the most important outcome from this class for my students. I can't emphasize how important this is to me in the theory of teaching this class. Are yeah. Are you going to do like the, this, the scientific method, on all of the tests? The first and last, okay. the final exam in this one. I, I was like, I don't know how this applies to chemistry. How what? I was like, I don't really know how you could apply this to chemistry. Oh, well, you can apply it anywhere. So I mean, chemistry is a science, so it's built on the same thing. Okay, areas of physical science. What are the areas of physical science? Physics. Physics, the fundamental science. Did you say emoji? Chemistry. Okay. Geology. And I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure the textbook lists this. Okay. So those are our five areas. And so far, we have the physics. Next test will be over chemistry. And then we'll have these all kind of put together. I think that it might be geology and astronomy and then, I, I, I don't know. I, let me not try to overstate what I remember. I know the next one's going to be chemistry. Those are the two biggies. So now let's talk about physics. So right, what we talked so far today for the first 17 minutes class, homework problem and science. So physics, chapter one was looking at motion equilibrium. Fit a lot into the chapters in this book. So make sure you know the difference in Aristotelian and Galilean ideas of motion. Aristotle thought that there was a natural motion of being at rest. That was what was natural. And if you put a violent act on something, you can make it do something unnatural, but then it'll return to natural motion. And he thought that there were natural positions. You know, earth should be on the ground. Water should be on top of earth. Air should be on top of water. Fire should be on top of that. And so things would go to their natural positions. Galileo said, nay, nay. He said that there is no natural motion. The natural thing to do is for an object to just keep moving at a constant velocity. And that Newton's first law of motion is a statement of that idea from Galileo. Newton's first law of motion is the idea of inertia, that an object stays in constant motion unless something acts on it. So make sure you understand what that inertia is. What are the units of inertia? The mass and weight. Okay, so unit would be the unit of mass, not weight. And so the unit of mass is kilogram. So the kilogram is the unit for inertia. Because it's the unit for mass, and mass is a measurement of how much inertia an object has. So something with more mass, more inertia means it's going to be harder to change its motion. Okay, then we have... Forces, as we said last class period, just to remind you, forces were anything that pushes or pulls. So you should make sure you're familiar with friction. We had multiple kinds of friction. We had static friction. Static friction is friction between two surfaces where the surfaces don't move with respect to each other. We had kinetic friction, which is friction between two surfaces when they're sliding. Two different kinds of friction, they're different because with static friction, you can have conformation. Remember, I used my fingers as an example. They kind of fit together, so it's harder to make them slide against each other. Once I make them slide, they actually have to move out, and it's easier to make them slide. So kinetic friction is going to be lower. Part of the reason we like anti-lock brakes in our cars, because they keep the tires from actually sliding against the ground. Hence, we can have a higher static friction and stop quicker with anti-lock brakes. 
Then we had normal force, which I believe our text was called support force. What direction is the normal force coming from this right here when I push on it? Out, right? It's not necessarily up. It's always directly out of the surface. And it's just to keep things from going into the surface. So like if I were to push this way on the table, it would still be going up. The normal would be up and the friction would be toward you. Yes. So you have two different forces there. The normal force, by the way, is caused by the electrostatic force, the force we just learned about. The electrostatic force is keeping the molecules in the floor from pulling apart. And so it's that force is keeping them from pulling apart that's resulting in the upward force on you. Okay, gravity. Gravity is always attractive. All objects are attracted to other objects if they have the gravitational charge, which we call mass. So mass is also the measurement of the gravitational charge that tells us how strong the gravitational force is. And you should know force is equal to force of gravity is equal to mass times gravity as long as you're on the surface of the earth. Where gravity in this case meant the acceleration of gravity 9.8 meters per second squared. Yes. Is it okay if I take hands on my hands? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> you know, that gives you a measure advantage. I don't know, so teachers don't like it. Actually, there is research that suggests that you don't learn while taking notes on computers. I'm not sure how much weight I put into that. I think a lot of it is also people get distracted with computers, and it's hard to separate those two. It's also really hard when teachers grade in red because it gives the students a negative effect on their brains. When teachers what? Grade in red. Really? Yeah, you never grade in red. It should be in blue or purple. Really? No blue or green, yeah. That's interesting. And if you're writing notes, it should be in purple because your brain will remember it more. Didn't know that. What? I know this is wasted physics time, but why would red be correlated with negative? I think if you. If teachers always grade them with blue, then it would be correlated with blue. Yeah, that, that's what I would suspect too, is because you don't use the color that everyone else uses, would probably be more likely that don't use red. It's the, like, because I guess red is like a negative color, anyways, and so when they see their papers marked or circled in red, like it just gives a negative effect. There's a research, I actually almost did my research paper on it. There's tons of research on it. That's interesting. Yeah, you should look into it. Uh, yeah, I should. There's a teacher some, who has changed it. Some colors are like scientifically proven to be like calming and stuff. Like I know like blues and greens. Like some people like purposely decorate the blues and greens because they're more calming or whatever. I guess it's the same kind of There's a teacher on here who will not on this campus who will not bring them right. Interesting. I, yeah, I think it is calming. Yeah. All right. Moving on. <laughs> Finally, tension is another force you should make sure you're comfortable with. Tension is a force that is delivered through something like a rope. And whenever the rope touches anything, it's going to put a force on that object equal to the tension in the direction that the rope is leaving the object. So as an example, for today's purposes, this is going to be my rope. So if I have this hanging on my finger, it's going to make forces on my finger both of the places it leaves my finger. And the magnitude of those forces will be equal to the tension. And so, you know, depending on how it's oriented, the forces are in different directions. Okay, equilibrium. Equilibrium means equal forces, or a net force is zero. There's also equal torques, but we didn't talk about torques, so as far as you're concerned, equilibrium is equal forces. So if I have an object in equilibrium, that means, what does that symbol mean? Sum of. So that's what equilibrium means. So if you have something like a woman is standing on, okay, the, the homework problem you have is a man standing, so I changed to a woman, standing on two scales, and one scale says, 25 pounds, the other one says 65 pounds, what's the total weight of the woman? You can solve that by saying, well, the sum of the forces on the woman is zero because she's in equilibrium. And so you have 25 coming up on one side, 65 coming up on the other. Her weight is going down, so it has to be her weight minus 25 minus 65 equals zero. And so you get a weight is 90 pounds, which would be a light woman. I just made numbers up off the fly. Don't want anything. Wow, he's unrealistic. <laughs> All right. 
Then we have motion. Make sure that you're clear on the difference in speed and velocity. Velocity is a vector. It has direction. Speed doesn't have direction. Both of them have, a, have how fast you're moving, which is what the word speed means. So velocity is speed with direction. Acceleration is the rate at which the velocity is changing. So if you speed up, changing velocity. If you slow down, you're changing velocity. Or if you change direction, you're changing velocity. Any one of those three things is an acceleration. And then we have our mathematical equations, the kinematic equations. They will be given to you on the test. You don't have to have them memorized. You don't have to have any equations memorized. You will have things like, well, I think I might have put the way the textbook did. Distance is equal to initial speed multiplied by time plus one half acceleration multiplied by speed squared. That's how you can calculate the distance something travels if it has an initial speed and you know it's acceleration. Wait, so it's supposed to be time squared or speed squared? Um, it's time squared. It's speed multiplied by time plus one half acceleration multiplied by time squared. So you'll want to be able to use this equation to calculate how far something travels. Also, the change in speed is equal to acceleration multiplied by time. So you want to be able to calculate how much the speed is going to change. Now notice this is speed. It's not velocity. It's just one dimensional here. But if you have an acceleration, it's going to cause your speed to change as per that equation. So make sure you can do those kinds of calculations. Then we get to Newton's laws. Here are his three laws. The law of inertia. We've already talked about that. The second law says that the acceleration of an object is equal to the net force on the object divided by its mass. So that's a super important one because it connects forces to motion. Using that law, we can go from, okay, these forces are acting on an object. Like, let's say you toss me out the window of an airplane. The forces acting on me are going to be ignore air, force of gravity down, nothing else. And since the force of gravity is equal to mass times G, then I would have, here's me, forces, and Newton's second law says my acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces over my mass is equal to mg over m. Say, aha, Richard must be accelerating at G. 9.8 meters per second squared. So you should understand that kind of idea. Or you could have a box. You know, a girl is pushing the box with a force of 10 newtons. Friction is applying 5 newtons in the opposite direction. What's the acceleration of the box? Some of the forces. What would the sum of the forces be if I have 10 newtons this way and 5 newtons that way? 5 newtons. And so then my acceleration would be 5 newtons divided by the mass of the box. So I need to know the mass, and I can calculate what the acceleration of the result is. The third law, for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. If I put a force on object B, object B is going to put an equal force back on me, but in the opposite direction. So if I kick Amber's backpack, and I apply, it's a very small kick, so one newton of force to the backpack, it's going to apply one newton of force on my foot in exactly the opposite direction that I apply. The backpack may go flying. That's not because it had a lesser force. It's because the net force of the backpack made it accelerate, as per Newton's second law. Because the backpack's force on me is not a force acting on the backpack. Newton's second law is only applying to the objects you're looking at. So that's. <laughs> I know we're only in chapter two, but that's a huge portion of the test, the scientific method, and being able to do these force ideas. Yes? So when you say be able to use these laws, are you mm -hmm. talking about like equations with them? Um, you'll have both. There, there won't be many equations in the test, but you will probably have to do something with equations and then something where you answer, you know, just, you know, like I said, Amber kicks her bag with a force of seven newtons. How hard does the bag push on Amber? Right, it's not a calculation there per se. It's understanding equal and opposite. So you have both. What does mg stand for? Um, m is the mass of the object. G is the acceleration of gravity. So g is a constant. 
and our textbook used 10, 9.8 okay. meters per second squared. Okay. Our textbook uses 10 just because it makes the calculation easier. We're not trying to make calculations hard. So you, is it I'm happy either way. I'll probably put 9.8 on the exam, but if you use 10, I'm not going to mark you wrong. All right. Chapter three was momentum and energy. Momentum relates to force. Newton's second law is really a momentum equation. It says that the net force on object is equal to the rate at which momentum is changing. That's what it really says. What we learned, what was important to us in our lab, was that the change in momentum is equal to the net force multiplied by time. And so we call that change in that net force multiplied by time the impulse. And we had some real problems in interpretation on the lab. When I was looking at the results, people's graphs showed very clearly that in the elastic collision, the second collision, kinetic energy was conserved. And yet all but two people said it wasn't. And so that means everybody's got the wrong impression from that lab because they misinterpreted their graphs, which is really disappointing. I wish I had noted that during lab so I could have corrected that, but I was in my office grading. Um, so in the collisions, we had elastic collisions. Elastic collisions are defined as the collisions where energy is returned, so kinetic energy is conserved. And so in the case of the carts with the magnets where they never touched, you started with a certain kinetic energy between the carts. While they were interacting, the kinetic energy dropped. But then after it was done, it returned to the same value it had before. As I said, I was looking at the students' graphs, and it, it was really clear. Yeah, it turned. the graphs were showing things like, here's the total, like that. And you say, well, was this the same as this? Okay, my, my picture here <laughs> is not the perfect example. But, you know, if you, if you continue on, yes, it was the same. Oh, so you basically aren't talking about if the, like, energy like dropped or not it's just if it goes back to where it was yeah before. if the before and the after are the same if it changes from before to after okay <clears throat> so um make sure you can do simple conservation mental problems you know like the one i talked about with ice skating and pushing somebody momentum before the momentum after are the same which is only going to be true if the net external force is zero if there's a net external force that's not zero momentum won't be conserved then we have the work energy relationship remember work work is force times distance parallel to that force so right now amber's water ball is not moving so the distance is zero and you say there's no work if I take a water bottle, I am putting an upward force on it. If I move with a constant velocity sideways, my force is up, the distance is horizontal. How much of that horizontal distance is parallel to my force? If the force is going up, it's horizontal. Right, it's zero, right? Because it's perpendicular. So there's no work involved with just carrying this moving horizontally at constant speed. But if I raise it, then I had an upward force and it had an upward distance, and the work is mass times gravity, the force gravity with mg, multiplied by the distance I raised it. So understand that idea about what work is. And then energy is the ability to do work. And you can have the ability to do work because of position. I hold the remote up here. If I let go, gravity will do work, make it fall. So we call that potential energy. Or if I run, I could do work on something because I'm moving. So, you know, person running and hitting another person, they're going to do work on that person based on the fact that they were moving. So we call that kinetic energy. So we have two kinds of, of energy, potential energy based on position, and you'll have the primary relationship, mass times gravity times elevation is the potential energy due to gravity. And then kinetic energy, energy that something has because it's moving, this one half mass times speed squared. And work 
is actually, here's the work energy relation and it's net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So that's our work energy and momentum stuff. At that point, we've covered what is, well, what is the biggest chunk of physics, what we call dynamics. Dynamics is why things move. So then we moved on to other interesting areas in physics. We moved into fluids and how fluids work. So we have a fluid is anything that can flow. That's the definition of fluid. Gases, liquids, they're both fluid because they both flow. So the first thing we defined was density. Density is the mass per volume. So if you take the same volume of iron versus water, okay, this isn't the same volume, this is more volume. The iron is going to weigh more. That means that it's more dense. The mass in the volume is bigger. The ratio of M over V is density is bigger. Pressure is now what we've already learned the word force. Now we have a force applied to an area. So sticking with, well, let's go to Amherst Bible. Amherst Bible, which is on top of everything else, which as I learned is the proper respect to show for Bible, has a downward force due to gravity. And then it's pushing on an area equal to the size of the bottom. And so the pressure it's applying to her little folder here is the weight of the Bible divided by that surface area. Now, if I take this and I put it on top of her cell phone, the weight is the same, but the area has gotten smaller that it's distributed over. So what is that doing to the pressure? Increasing it, right. Now with fluids, the pressure is due to basically the weight of what's above them. So if you go deeper in water, the weight of the water above you is more, hence the pressure is more. And so the pressure increases with depth in a fluid by the relationship that pressure difference is equal to density times acceleration of gravity times the depth of the water. I put H here for height. Same thing works with air. So we have air above us. The air pressure is roughly speaking, there's other things involved, but roughly speaking, it's the density of the air times gravity times the height of the column of air above us. Now keep in mind the density of the air changes with elevation. So when you do the calculation, it's not just multiply density times g times h. You actually have to do what we call an integral, something new invented. But that's what results in our air pressure. So at Amber's home, which is over 10,000 feet elevation, there's a lot less air above her than there is here. There's roughly two miles less air above her. And since there's roughly two miles less of air, the air pressure is much lower there. Okay, Archimedes principle. You don't have to know the story about Archimedes, you know, the crown and whatnot. But you should know, very important, once again from lab, we had that the buoyant force, the upward force produced on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. And something floats if the buoyant force is equal to its weight. So if, it, if the buoyant force is equal to the weight, that means it's going to displace water that weighs the same as the object. If you have an object that's less dense than water, then it will float because it's impossible for it to displace a, a volume of water that, excuse me, it will float because it can easily displace water that weighs the same as it. If an object is more dense than water, it will sink because if it displaces its entire volume, the weight of water with that volume is less than the weight of the object. So less dense things float on more dense things is the really important outcome of Archimedes principle, but you should definitely know the weight of the fluid displaced equals the buoyant force. Then finally, Bernoulli's principle here. Remember me bringing out the blow dryer? We blew air over the paper and the air came up because when the air is blowing over the paper, what is it doing in terms of pressure? Lowers, Lowers pressure. So the faster the air is blowing, the lower the pressure is. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so that's Bernoulli's principle is how airplanes fly. It's how sailboats sail. Back in the long, long ago, they had ships that would have a sail like this. So wind blows. I meant to change color. So wind blows like this, and it makes the sailboat move. In that situation, the maximum speed you could ever possibly attain would be the speed of the wind. That's not how sailboats work today. You have the sail and you set it, set the sail so wind is blowing like this. And you have a longer distance on the front side than the back side, which creates a force forward. And so you have a, a net force that is going this direction because you have pressure low on this side and pressure high on this side because faster speed on the side with more curve. That's what makes a sailboat move. And with that principle, you can get sailboats to go much faster than the wind speed, which might seem a little shocking. But then it comes to Newton's second law, net force is mass times acceleration. If you can get a good force from that wind and you don't have much resistive force from the water, you can accelerate to a higher speed. That's why I don't know if you guys watch America's Cup racing, but these days they do it on catamarans. Catamarans have much less hole in the water. And then they use hydrofoils to lift the holes out of the water. The whole point of the hydrofoil is to get it so you have very little hole in the water, hence very little backward force, so that forward force can accelerate to a higher and higher speed. Totally cool physics involved. There's totally cool physics involved in most sporting events. Oh, then we get to thermodynamics. Make sure you understand like what temperature is. Not just, oh, temperature, hot, cold, but the temperature is telling you about the, go ahead. Is it like your hands are supposed to be able to convert? Yes, you do need to know the different scales to be able to convert. But, but also the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. So higher temperature means the molecules are moving faster. Lower temperature means the molecules are moving slower. That's fundamentally what we get out of temperature. We have four laws. I like one of the questions somebody gave, you know, how many laws are there for thermodynamics? For the answer, first, second, third, zero, four, right? Because that's actually the order of creation as I understand it. The first law was the first one created, the second law, the second one, the third one, the third one, and then the fourth one they created said it was more fundamental, so it's the zero. So you have the four laws stated here. Zeroth law is so obvious. If temperature one is temperature two, and temperature two is temperature three, and the temperature one is temperature three. That's like saying if A is equal to 5 and B is equal to A, then B is equal to 5. It's, it's not hard mathematically. But it turns out the temperature was more significant than they thought. The first law, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now let's make sure we contrast that with what we learned about in elastic collision. Elastic collisions, not all collisions are elastic. In elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. Whereas the First law of thermodynamics says all energy is conserved. Kinetic is just one form of energy. You put it all together, that gives you the total energy, which the first law states. The first law has some really important ramifications, like perpetual motion machines. A perpetual motion machine is something that has its energy remaining constant and never drop it. Well, that's not violating the first law. But I have known people who believe that you should be able to make a perpetual motion machine to generate power, to generate energy. Well, that would require an increase in overall energy. So it's absolutely impossible to have a perpetual motion machine and then get energy out of it while it continues to move. The second law, which I have here, heat naturally flows from hotter materials to colder materials. Another outcome of the second law is a perpetual motion machine is also possible. So, laws of dynamics in a perpetual motion machine, which is why in one episode of The Simpsons, Homer shouts at Lisa saying, we obey the second law of dynamics in this household because she made a perpetual motion machine for her class project. Totally, nobody's seen that, right? Oh, well. The, the third law, nothing can reach absolute zero. Now, with temperature, I didn't talk about absolute zero today, but I should. 
if temperature is measured proportional to the average kinetic energy, there is a minimum that you can have for kinetic energy. That is at rest. And so absolute zero would correspond with that idea of coming to rest. Quantum mechanically, it's not quite, but it's close enough. We are almost there. This is the last chapter we covered. Static and... Wow. Static and current electricity doesn't really make sense. How about static electricity and electric current? We didn't actually talk about electric current anyway. Let's just, yeah. I, I'm now feeling all kinds of self-conscious because I love to use red. It's pretty. But apparently pretty is not calming. <laughs> um, so static electricity know what electric charge is electric charge is the thing that we can perceive there is an electric force that comes from it's something that is fundamental to material it can't be created or destroyed we can't identify it, it, it's kind of sad you know when you get more into the nitty gritty you know what gives something mass? That's a really complicated question. They're spending billions of dollars, well, you know, like it's sir, trying to, to learn more about what is mass and what gives things mass. Charge is the same type of thing. It's something that's just fundamental. It's something things have. And you have two types of charge. You have positive charge and negative charge. And all you have to know at this point is what's on this slide. That is, you need to be able to use Coulomb's law, the force between two charges, is equal to K times charge one times charge two over the separation squared. And you need to know that opposites attract, likes repel, and that if you separate charges, you'll have electrical polarization. That is, you that's the name that we give it when you separate the charge. And we'll learn more about this in lab tomorrow. That's the, the topic of lab tomorrow. To help you prepare more for the test. What does R stand for again? Um, R is the separation between the centers of the charges. So it's Q times Q times 2? No, it's Q1, the charge of object oh. 1, multiplied by Q2, the charge of object 2, gotcha. divided by the separation between them squared. And K is a constant. K is a constant. For your purposes, it's 9 times 10 to the 9th meters squared for Coulomb squared. Wait, what? The so K, times? the value of K. No, what was K again? Nine times to the nine. It'll be on the test. You don't have to have that memorized. Oh, we don't. Yeah. Right? Memorization is like the very lowest level of learning. <laughs> We're not very concerned with memorization in science classes. Well, except for biology. Biology is more concerned with it than the rest of us. Amber. Go back to chapter six, please. Oh, yeah. I should mention heat. <laughs> now that we're back here. Heat. Heat is not the same as temperature. Often people get the two confused. Heat is a transfer of energy due to temperature difference. Heat naturally flows from hot to cold. That's the statement of the second law up here. And so heat is energy transfer. Things can't possess heat because you can't possess a transfer. They possess internal energy. When energy goes out, their internal, internal energy drops. So if they do work, internal energy drops, or if heat flows out, internal energy drops. So they have internal energy. Energy leaving could be either work or heat. Those are the two ways that you can lose or gain energy. Could you say what temperature is? Temperature is a measure that's telling us about the average kinetic energy of the molecules. And as Hannah said, you do need to be able to deal with both Celsius and Fahrenheit, and I say both, all three, and Kelvin's and be able to convert from one to that. You'll have the equations, but you have to be able to use those equations. And of course, you might have the question I think Lindsay gave us of what is zero degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit? You know, that I expect you to have memorized just because you use it in everyday life. But if not, you can use the calculation and get there still. Yes. So we're gonna need to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit? You, you might have to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit or to Kelvin. So how do we do that again? Okay, the equation is that 
temperature, and I'll put it the opposite order that I did the first time when I lectured on it. Temperature Fahrenheit is equal to nine fifths temperature Celsius plus 32. Is that it? I thought I had the other one. I thought I had temperature Celsius is equal to five ninths temperature Fahrenheit minus 32. Yeah, the equation will be. Oh, okay. Which so one are you going to use, though? They're the same Fahrenheit. equation. So you'll use one or the other, or you'll put both? Probably just one because they're the same equation. But I, that one looks better than that one. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> All right, well, we're out of time, and we've covered everything I intended to cover, which is like perfect. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow for lab.